start off the afternoon program for Singapore Perspectives 2014 with a face-off between two leading intellectuals in Singapore. They will debate the motion, this conference resolves that consensus rather than contest will secure Singapore's future. The proposer is Professor Kishore Mabubani, an academic, diplomat and frequently published expert on Asian and world affairs. Professor Mabubani is Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. In 2010 and 2011, he was selected as one of the top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy, a magazine on global politics, economics and ideas. Opposing the motion is Professor Chua Beng Huat, a renowned sociologist and a leading commentator on comparative politics in Southeast Asia, urban planning and public housing, and rising consumerism. He has contributed to the shaping of young minds in Singapore for over two decades as a professor at the National University of Singapore. During the course of the debate, we will be inviting you, the audience, to use your polling devices to register your agreement with either the proposer, the dean, or the opposer, Prof Chua. This will be done a number of times so that we can see if your views change as the debate progresses. And we are delighted to have a familiar face from the Singapore media chairing the debate today. She is someone you would have seen on television news. Ms. Deborah Soon is currently Managing Director of Channel News Asia, Media Corp Private Limited. And I will now hand over to Ms. Soon to tell you more about the rules of this debate. Ms. Soon. Thank you very much, Lynn. Indeed, it's a privilege and honour to be here today to chair this illustrious panel together with such an illustrious crowd, even if we're the first item after lunch. Two of the best thinkers in town, Professor Mabubani and Professor Chua, both need no introduction, even though Lynn has done an excellent job. I think that IPS has been particularly brilliant in coming up with this format of a debate, and I do expect an extremely entertaining and engaging session because, firstly, Neither of them got to choose the topic that they're speaking on. They were assigned their topic. The debate will also allow them, in the competitive nature of this contest, to do their best to win the argument, persuade and challenge with the most provocative and interesting ideas, without having to worry that they will be labelled as having also personally believed those ideas. So I thought, brilliant, well done, IPS. <laughs> The motion, this conference resolves that consensus rather than contest will secure Singapore's future. We'll have eight minutes at the start with the proposer, eight minutes for the opposer. After that, we will have one question to each of them, then they will cross-examine each other. We will take a vote again. After that, we'll open the floor to questions. All right? So at the start now, I'm supposed to ask all of you to take your position and vote for whether you agree with the the motion that this conference resolves that consensus rather than contest will secure Singapore's future. And we'll see whether or not your views change along the way. Your poll question starts now. So if you agree, please press one. And if you do not agree, please press two. Very interesting. Why, a very conservative crowd. <laughs> so, Kishore, you do not have to push the boulder up the hill. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like the proposer of the motion, invite Professor Kishore to take his position at the mic and to give us his opening remarks when you get out. Uh, thank you, Deborah. As you said, that vote was a big surprise, you know. <laughs> I thought that the IPS crowd would be in favour of contestation, <laughs> not consensus. <laughs> I think we chose the wrong crowd. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Anyway, as you know, uh, it's also a mistake to ask, for an, ask an argumentative Indian like me to 
support consensus when in fact it should be a consensual Chinese like Beng Wad <laughs> who should be supporting consensus. But I do actually fortunately uh, believe that at this stage uh, of Singapore's development, frankly, we do need more consensus uh, than contestation. Because I think if you really want to discuss the issue of consensus versus contestation, you have to add another C word. And the other C word is context. And there may have been a time, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when probably we would have been better off having more contestation. But in today's context, it's very clear that we are clearly entering a completely new political era in Singapore. In fact, look, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, it's very clear that possibly for about 40 years from roughly, let's say, 1971 to 2011, and I begin with 1971 because we had sufficient progress after independence, and I end with 2011 because the 2011 elections, as you all know, was a watershed elections. And those, in those 40 years, Singapore essentially lived in a wonderful political bubble where you had year after year, decade after decade, continuing peace and prosperity. And we came to take it for granted that this is the normal situation for Singapore. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that the last 40 years have actually been very abnormal and that the normal is actually coming back to Singapore. And when the normal comes back to Singapore, that's when you begin to realize, yes, we will need more consensus than contestation. And how, how would I characterize this new normal in Singapore? Well, the best way to describe what is normal is to look at other countries to understand what is normal for most countries in the world. Because if you look, at, look around since the post-independence era, virtually no country like Singapore has gone from third world to first in one generation. And that's that sheer fact makes us so exceptional and it makes it also very clear that we are not the normal country. So let me give you some examples of normal countries and what Singapore might have to deal with as we return to the norm. Firstly, you know, when the British had a period of decolonization, and you see, you know, the British Empire extended all over the world, they actually left behind multiracial British colonies all over the world. You mentioned a few, Guyana in South America, Cyprus in Europe, Sri Lanka in South Asia, Singapore in Southeast Asia, and Fiji in the Pacific. And if you look at all these five, four out of the five, as you know, have experienced turmoil. In some cases, like Sri Lanka and Cyprus, very painful wars and divisions. By contrast, Singapore, after 69, complete peace and harmony. So is our kind of peace and harmony that we enjoyed the last 40 years the norm? Or is what was experienced by the other ex-British colonies the norm? And I suggest to you that as we move towards the norm, there will be rising divisions in Singapore. And this will happen even if internally we do the right things because some of the challenges are going to seep into Singapore from outside. This morning, Zainal, I must say, you are very brave, Zainal, in saying that Singaporeans do not understand the Malays. Do not understand. And in many ways, 
they do not understand because what is influencing the Malay Muslim community is also forces that come from outside. And to give you a simple example of the transformation, when I went as a student to Kuala Lumpur to visit the University of Malaya campus, right? I went there and I saw young Malay girls wearing mini skirts in the 1960s like everyone else. Today, I go back to the same campus. I don't see any Malay girls wearing any mini skirts and 99.9% .9 dress with a tudong. How did it happen? Was it an internal transformation or was it an external transformation? It was external. This doesn't mean that what they did was wrong, but they have changed and have we understood the change. And I can tell you, for a primarily Chinese majority society, at a time when the number one emerging power in the world is China, and at a time when China's influence will grow in every sense, politically, culturally, economically. And if you're going to say that the Singapore Chinese community will not be affected by this at all, that its primary identity will always be Singaporean and not be affected by that, it's conceivable. But you all know, if you look around the world, more and more societies are being influenced by external trends. And paradoxically, since we have chosen as our destiny to be the most open, the most globalized city in the world, guess what? We will be the most open to all these new global waves. And when they come, you will all say, please, let us have more consensus in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kishaw. Right on time. I invite now Professor Chua to take his stand. Um, since I am not ethnically Indian, I thought I would at least pretend <laughs> to be Indian and at least try to be contentious. Uh, and actually, I've already lost the debate in this crowd, even before I started. But anyway, let me try to convince you otherwise. Um, to begin with, how do we in fact come to have this topic of debate? And the reason I would suggest that is apparently we have had consensus among Singaporeans in the past and that this consensus has been the basis of our economic development and of our present success, which probably explains the sentiments in the first voting round. And some would like to return to that state and to perpetuate it in view of the gathering pace of public contentions and challenges to, to official policies on many fronts for probably about 20 years now, although most people think it's a 2011 phenomenon. The different fronts that, it, that, that public policy has been challenged has been on income inequality, gender inequality, nature of capital punishment, intensified religiosity, and the total population. What we have, therefore, is a path of consensus, if we had one at all. I would suggest that that wasn't a particular, as Kishore said, an abnormal moment in the history of Singapore. So what, if, what we have made, therefore is a path of consensus, but, a, but an emerging presence of contention. The question is, did we really have consensus without contention even during the rapid economic growth phases? 
even during the 40 years of context that Kishore refers to. Firstly, contestation was suppressed very forcefully from the early 1960s to about the mid-1970s, a period which most of us would like to forget about because it's a period marked by excesses of authoritarian repression. Dissent was therefore suppressed, lie dormant, but did not disappear. Secondly, economic development programs have provided full employment, public housing, mass education, improved public health, and overall improvement and rising standard of living. For a population that had been living with chronic unemployment and material deprivation, what was there not to like? What was there not to agree with the economic development program? What was there to contest? If there were a consensus, it was because citizens had, by that time, weighed up the benefits of, to their lives. They had, albeit quietly, debated among themselves and within themselves the options and agreed that the government policy at that time were better than to improve their life and therefore supported it. But had contention therefore disappeared, as some people might suggest, the governed will always want to be heard, always want to hear different proposals so that they can come to an informed decision. Contention may then remain invisible until a specific public policy is obviously unacceptable, contentious. So, for an example, in the midst of, suppose, of the supposed consensus, at the peak of the popularity of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the government hoisted on the population the graduate mother policy. The people protested and protested very, very loudly. The ones who protested most and the loudest were in fact the graduate women who stood to, be be to benefit from the policy, but were indignant about the blatant class discrimination against their lesser educated counterpart. There is an ethical and moral system at work, not just the economy. This very significant protest against the graduate mother policy should have put paid to any assumption that Singaporeans are not thinking people and simply following the dictate of the ruling government. A simplistic impression that misrecognized the citizens' agreement with the government policy as political docility. This misrecognition was at one time so widespread that it even caused Kishore himself to ask rhetorically, can Asians think? <laughs> Including Singaporeans, of course. So we should remind ourselves that no genuine consensus can be obtained without prior contention. Without prior debate of differences, any call any so-called agreement is really simply an imposition on those over whom we have power. Men over women, bosses over employees, government over the governed. Such imposition will always leave dissatisfaction, unhappiness, and dissent and rebelliousness suppressed by waiting for its moment to burst forth. If we desire consensus on public policies to secure Singapore's future, we will, be, we will need to be more practiced at contestation and contention in order to arrive at policies that we can all support. If indeed we had an era of consensus, I would suggest that, that, age of con that the age of contention has already been with us for about two decades. The formulation of the shared value in 1991, from which the topic of debate undoubtedly derived, was the first attempt by the government to put a lid on the emerging contention age. But the lid, putting a lid on a pressure cooker, might hold it for a while, but is ultimately futile. In the end, when a slew of government policies without consultation converged to produce a state of deterioration of many aspects of everyday life, at the end of the last decade of, of last decade, the citizens in spoke 2001 GE now widely known as the watershed that bring what is now called the new normal. 
And this new normal has already produced very positive results. Government recognition of the problem of intensifying social and economic inequalities, a rethink of population density projection, the removal of mandatory capital punishment for drug trafficking, easing of pressure on children's education, and very significantly, the radical reduction of ministerial and presidential salaries, an imposition at the height of the PAP's power, but an unhappiness among the citizens that took 20 years to finally be heard and acted upon. There has always been contention. Even the PAP and the cabinet insist that there is no group think in the party and the government. Even if both project, even if both project a united stand on every issue after an agreement has been achieved, there is no avoiding even greater public debate and contention on issues of Singapore future in the future. Professor Chua, thank you. Thank you. Uh, your time is up. If you could just stay at the podium. Let me ask you the first question. If you just return back to the podium, I'll ask you the first question related to what you've just spoken about. Uh, you seem to suggest that the last 10, 20 years has been about contest and contentation, contestation in Singapore. Are you suggesting then that given Singapore's context and the changing world economy, that this is still the way to go and that, or that it should be public contest, that the debates and discussions should be made public and not so much behind the scenes? I'm suggesting that the debate and the contestation had never gone away. It had always been there. It is the very nature of politics. It is the very nature of the relations between those who are governed and those doing the governing. The difference is, in the past, the forum for public airing of the differences was very limited to a single page of the Straits Times. And we all know what goes into the, what gets edited out of the Straits Times. <laughs> so if there were a consensus, it was also partly manufactured by the absence of platforms. The internet didn't just suddenly produce contentious Singaporeans. The internet merely provided the unlimited space for all the differences that had been held at bay either forcefully or with the absence of forum. So I think that any assumption that we have been living in a consensus society is at best an illusion. <laughs> the, only dif the difference is now with the internet, it is no longer to keep able to keep the differences under wrap behind closed doors and project a common front. Okay, so, thank you very much. Next question, Professor Kishore, if you'd like to take the mic at the podium. You talked about Singapore being an abnormal society. We are moving towards a more normal state of affairs. Is the way forward, how is consensus then going to help Singapore develop as it becomes more normal as a society? Well, let me begin by actually surprising Beng Huat by agreeing with him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the last 40 years that I spoke about, uh, 1971 to 2011, when he described how in many ways it was an era in which the government was making many of the key decisions, leading the debate, framing the issues. Yes, it was very much a top-down era. I agree. But that's not what consensus is all about. And I'm glad that just before I came up to the podium, I borrowed uh, Chu Chao Beng's uh, iPad, <laughs> checked on Wikipedia to make sure what I understood the meaning of the word consensus. <laughs> and the meaning of the word consensus is that it is not a top-down process, but a bottom-up process. So I'm not arguing, even though Beng Huat thinks I'm arguing that, 
that we can go back to the days of 1971 to 2011, where you have a top-down process. That era is gone. You have a much more assertive, demanding population. Contestation is naturally rising. And it is in a context where contestation is naturally rising, that's when you need more consensus. Because the context has changed, the needs have changed. You can go back and argue about what was good or bad over the past 40 years, and the arguments will carry on. But those arguments are irrelevant because we will never ever go back to that era. And so when you ask me, Deborah, right, what is this new normal? This new normal means that we have a very different world globally and a very different world domestically. We also have, I mean, we have had, we've had one of the best education systems in the world, and therefore we have one of the best educated populations in the world, and they will no longer accept the kind of diktats that our population in the past would accept. And now they expect to be consulted, they expect to be part of the decision-making process, and they, say, and they want to be part of the consensus-making. And that's why I keep emphasizing that given today's different context, where you have pressures coming from outside, pressures coming from inside, and if you just focus on contestation and accentuate the differences, then I fear that Singapore will be torn apart. And to avoid Singapore being torn apart, and I might tell you, this is not a hypothetical fear. If I did a reali realistic scenario planning, and you know what scenario planning is about, I can easily describe to you a scenario where Singapore continues to go downhill. So in that context, in this different context, I assure you that what we need today is more consensus. Thank you, Professor Kishore. I will now give Professor Chua a chance, eight minutes, to take on Professor Kishore's arguments. So he will do the questioning. And after that, it will be Professor Kishore's turn to question Professor Chua. So Professor Chua, if you are ready. Yes. Uh it's interesting. I actually agree with Kishore that the last four... <laughs> this is a tough debate, guys. <laughs> that the last 40 years had been abnormal. <laughs> and as I said, the last, year, the last 40 years has been abnormal because contestation had sort of disappeared lulling us into belief that we live in a consensus society. It has disappeared to the point where uh, Singaporeans were thought to be depoliticized, no longer political. In fact, as I said, when the chance, when the opportunity for political, for being political appeared, they took to it enthusiastically. But the in, the, I think that the, abnormal, the abnormality is very interesting because that's why after 2011, when the term new normal was uh, being bandied about in the same Singapore perspective at the time, I had argued that we were simply ambling towards the normal rather than arriving at a new normal because a society in which public debate were completely suppressed without any kind of uh, opportunity for it to be aired is abnormal in spite of its economic successes, in spite of its economic development, in spite of the material improvement of the massive improvement of material life of Singaporeans. So what, have, what are we heading towards? We're heading towards a more normal democratic society. It is also, as Kishore would say, that contentions will become 
not necessarily more intensified as he said it would be, but as I said, that has always been there, but now more public. And because it's more public, the decisions that finally had to be made will probably be supported much better and, and also will not have to take 20 years for the unhappiness to be finally rectified, as in the case of the salaries of ministers. Professor Chua, would you like to ask Professor Kishore well, a question directly? The, my, you know, what I would like to know about from um, Kishore, which is interesting, is that he said that we are not, he is not asking for a return to a mythological past of consensus. Because I think, as he knows, if to do that will be to be engaged in a nostalgia that is futile. Nostalgia, as you know, has no future. So we are talking about the future. We are talking about the future and we are talking about future in which, as he says rightly, open expressions of differences, open expressions of different desires, different imaginations of what the world should become will actually become intensified. And therefore, how do we arrive at the consensus other than by more debate and more public discussions because to do otherwise, to, it would be to truncate the very process of open discussions and uh, arriving in genuine consensus, right? But to, to, to do otherwise would be to cut off the debate that is necessary. And to do so will again, as I said, leave behind a very unhappy citizenry in spite of growing wealth uh, and I should add, not just growing wealth, but growing income inequality. So my question is, is there any other way of arriving at a consensus that is desired without much more open debate and without the fact that we should now, because of our 40 years of, of normal past, train ourselves to be able to deal with each other openly in our differences. The same as we are making reference to Zaino, uh, our good friend. I told Zaino part of the problem as a sociologist of not being able to understand Malays, the Malay community see, uh, in depth is because I was never given the real feeling about what the Malay community feels. Because it has always been mediated by community leaders that are already handpicked. It is always mediated by including the very last, including two days ago when the Prime Minister said that he had an open, frank discussion behind closed doors. <laughs> How frank and open can it be to the rest of us when we are not behind those closed doors? How are, we expected to, how are we expected to understand how the Malays feel if we, don't, we are not part of that closed door? How are we going to actually come to an understanding that will in fact support or not support the Tudong issue? And it is an issue, if it is a national issue, it's not up to just the Malay community to resolve, but all of us to resolve. But to do that, we have to learn to be able to handle differences publicly. And only then, as Kishore rightly says, consensus must be arrived at. In fact, all contentions, all contestations are to arrive at a consensus. The question is in the process, not in the final outcome. I would like to know if there is any other formula of arriving at consensus without public debate and public contention. <laughs> Dean Kishore, you have about one minute left to respond to that, if you want. I have one minute? <laughs> it's the longest question I've heard, but yes. <laughs> I have one minute to respond. <laughs> For those now, seven minute long question. The chair will allow you a little bit more now time. Now you have 53 seconds. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, the, I would say, you know, he used a very nice phrase, a more normal democracy. That's a mythical world, a more normal democracy. Is Thailand a more normal democracy? No. Right? I mean, you have <laughs> elections, and the people reject the elections. Right? Is Ukraine a democracy? Well, you're right? picking all the wrong cases. <laughs> Let me, let me pick United States of America. Is Western Europe a democracy? Is, okay. Are Western European let me, let me, countries democracy? Is United States of America a democracy? I was just in Davos. And Tom Friedman, one of the world's most influential columnists, says, how is it you can have a country like United States of America with two or three hundred years of political tradition how does a small movement like the Tea Party hijack the whole government and bring it to the edge of a precipice? Is that a more normal democracy? Is that what Beng Wat wants for Singapore? <laughs> All right, in Kisha, I will give your time is up, but guess what? <laughs> You get a chance now to cross-examine Professor Chua, so you can ask him the question again, and he has to respond this time. I get a chance because to ask now him. you have eight minutes to cross-examine him. I, you get to ask him questions, unless you want to spend well, seven follow, and a half I'll minutes. Follow his tradition and ask a seven-minute-long question. Yes, that's what I said. Unless you want to do that, and give him one minute for the answer. <laughs> the you know I have the question in my mind as I listen to Bing Hua, and I'm actually, to be fair, quite sympathetic uh, to many <laughs> of his criticisms of the mistakes that we made. And I think it is abs an absolute fact that Singapore is not a perfect society. And we have made mistakes, and, and frankly, the government also acknowledges it's made lots of mistakes in the past few decades. But when you keep on banging your door against that past, you're wasting your time because that past is gone and cannot come back. And as he himself said, nostalgia is not about the future. And the future that is coming, I can guarantee you, is so different from what we've had in the past four decades. To keep knocking your head against the past 40 years is an absolute waste of time. So my question to Beng Huat is, look at Singapore as it exists today and ask yourself a very simple question. What are the existing vulnerabilities in Singapore society that in, if you allow this process of uninhibited un un uh, contestation could lead to lots of problems. And you know, when you have a society, and we've been talking using the word CMIO, 75% Chinese, 15% Malay, 6 to 8% Indian, then the rest others, is it natural for such a society to naturally have harmony? Or is it more natural to have division surface, where you no longer have the kind of strong top-down environment that was act providing a lid on the box and making sure that nothing got out of hand. So in the past, when someone made a in racial insult or an ethnic slur, you could be sure that the government would come down like a ton of bricks, right? Now you no longer have a government that comes down like a ton of bricks. What happens? Will these natural divisions surface again? And I can tell you that's why I actually think we have to pay attention to the fact that the era of normal democracies is gone. You know, even you mentioned wonderful Western Europe. How many of you saw an article in the International right. New York yes. Times, of this wonderfully happy society called Norway, which is one of the richest societies in the world, has lots of money, lots of welfare, 
And guess what? A few hundred Muslims came into Norway and lived in a neighborhood. And you know what happened? The Norwegians left that neighborhood. This is an open, tolerant, happy, welfare society. Very democratic, very advanced. But when you have these divisions, you can see what happens. So I can give you example after example in all corners of the world where things are falling apart. United States is, is a strong example. And I can tell you, the thing that struck me most about being in Davos, huh? and in fact, I asked Martin Wolf, the chief financial correspondent of the Financial Times. I said, how would you characterize the mood in the West today? It's a, it's a mood of deep pessimism. Most young people do not believe that the world of tomorrow will be better for them. In fact, they live in a state of fear for the future. And they also believe, and as you know, extremist right-wing parties are emerging in Western Europe in the land of advanced democracies. That's the new normal, these new divisions. So if, if, if even the advanced democracies are being subject to new stresses and strains, how can Chua Beng Huat so confidently predict that Singapore's democracy is so good that all these divisions will have no impact so whatsoever on Singapore. So what's your answer to that, Bingwa? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm glad that, I mean, the rising right wing of the world has been mentioned. And I think it's a very serious and important issue. And I think that one of the mistakes a lot of Singaporeans made is to simply equate ourselves with those conditions. And it is a very simple argument in Singapore that exists all the time is to say, if you give in on one on this, you're going to give in to a whole string of other things that come. You know, so every, every decision is a slippery slope. And I once to say to, uh, I, used, I did some research work on drug rehabilitation. And the interesting thing is to say, well, some people use drugs, but not everybody follows. Right? We have to believe in the basic ability of ordinary citizens to reason. And as Kishore says, now expressions of difference are much more forcefully made on the internet. And the government, wisely, is no longer there to police them. Because we don't need the government to police them. Because the other netizens on the internet checks them. And it is precise. And then if you look at what is happening in the local media and media all over the world, the mainline media is now tracking social media, not the other way around. If the debate goes on loud enough, long enough in the social media, the, official, the, the main media would have to pick up and the government would have to respond. The pressure is coming from the ground, not a bunch, not a group of people who who are, who, you know, who presume the privileged position of knowledge that just make the decision for our best interest. Our best interest is to be handled by ourselves. As a question, to the question of Islam, uh, to the question of rising right wing, it is really rising right wing primarily directed at Muslims, and particularly a confusion between Muslim fundamentalism and ordinary Muslims, individuals who, and families who just want to make a living. The reason I would suggest is because Europe had never seriously, never seriously, in spite of its constant rhetoric of liberalism, seriously tried to understand Islam. Because within the, within the rhetoric of, of, of liberalism, it's a constant believe that if we can talk long enough, we will be able to resolve our differences. But there are some differences that are fundamental, that people's life, people's definition of themselves depends on. 
if they should negotiate those fundamental beliefs, they will know what their life meanings are. And I said, I'm, I'm proposing that in the case of Europe, Christian Europe had never really tried to understand that fundamental difference. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chua. Our time is up. I'd like to invite all of you to pick up your voting devices. We're going to take another dipstick here to see how convinced you were by the two debaters who agreed with each other. And um, take a second poll. If I could also ask the conference organizers to remind us what the earlier vote was after we get the result, then we'll be able to see how much of a shift we have achieved. Proposition 210, Opposition 331, quite a good shift. If we can bring up the earlier score, please. If we, some of us, memory not so good anymore. So. During this break, maybe we could all think about the questions you want to ask because the next session will be an open round where all of you get a chance to throw your questions at either of the debaters. In the first poll, as you see, 249 were for the motion, 274, sorry, versus 210 now. And, uh, 187 for the opposition at the time versus 331 now. Quite a change. All right, so anybody would like to ask questions, please raise your hand. The conference organizer, please come to the mic and uh, ask your questions to either of the speakers. Anyone with the first question? The at the back over there. Thank you, Chair. In the light of the watershed election that occurred just now, with the percentages going exactly the other way around, <laughs> and in the spirit of open debate, I would like to ask each speaker to please ask himself one question, the answer to which would turn over his own arguments. So in other words, critique your critique of the other side. Ask yourself one question that would overturn the conclusions you've come to till now in the light of this watershed election. Uh, Let us argue a case for the other side, right? That's what you're asking them to do. No, but they have to do it themselves. It can't be the other side. <laughs> yeah, why would I want to do that? <laughs> because... <laughs> Asad, unfortunately, because it seems you've been overruled. Because it's the prerogative of the voters to ask the politicians to do exactly this. <laughs> We Sorry, voted. Asad, we didn't hear you properly. We are the voters, we voted for them, so it is our prerogative as a voter myself. <laughs> I'm asking them to critique themselves so that we know which better truth emerges from this self critique. <laughs> One question. I still don't understand the logic uh, of okay. this. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to be very simple. Dean Mehubani, please ask yourself a question that will overturn the conclusion that you came to till now that you've come to, and the same for Professor Chua. Well, I, I must say, Asad, I have great difficulty following your, your question. Uh, but anyway, I, I must say that um, I expected actually the second round of voting to be reflected in the first round of voting <laughs> uh, in, in this crowd. And uh, Benguat and I were discussing. And we were convinced that uh, the majority of you would be in favor of contestation and not of consensus at the beginning. So he was surprised, as I was surprised, that most of you were in favor of uh, consensus at first and then contestation 
later, which is which in itself it's an interesting uh, reflection uh, of what's going on here. And so I actually the, the, the question I had in my mind is simply: Is this is the composition in this room, in a sense, reflective of the general population of Singapore? If you had, in a sense, a, a, a representative sample of the population of Singapore, what would they say? And actually, I actually think they would argue for more contestation. And the reason why they would actually argue for more contestation, again, going back to my point of the context, it is in reaction against what's happened over the last 40 years. And, and that's, that's my concern. My concern is that so much of the reaction in Singapore against what happened the last 40 years will be focused on the past, not realizing that the future that is coming will be so different from the past. So my, my, my general point is that the debate about contestation and consensus should look at what's coming from the future and not focus on what's happening in the past. I agree. But <laughs> except, as I say, I have fundamental disagreement about the process. In the sense that in the past, right, the reason why is abnormal, there are several reasons why it's abnormal. One reason why it's abnormal is precisely the hidden nature of public debate, the absence of it, and creating, as I say, an illusion and even maybe even a complacency on the part of the government to believe that there is a consensus between them and the population. I agree that there was a consensus, but it wasn't a consensus of simply following. It was a consensus because the government policies were right. And if the government policies were right, and if we believe in the common rationality of individuals rather than an elitism that presumes that rationality lies in the, in the highly educated, there is every good reason to believe reasonable citizens would have supported those policies, even if they were public debates that there was no need to artificially hide the debates behind closed walls. There's no need to conduct debates only among the educated, that it could have been publicly aired. And we would have something like the ministerial salary wouldn't have passed. It wouldn't have carried on for 20 years of unhappiness among the people. So what we're heading towards is, as I said, I don't think that the debate, the contestation will intensify. I think it has always been there. It has been intensified by speed of technology, not by production of dissent, not by production of difference. I think the difference was always there, but always hidden. So now we, are, we better get practice in public debate, in open debate, because the mechanisms to hide it are uh, gone and over, right? So heading, uh, heading towards the future, the future definitely have to be secured by more open contestation to arrive at a consensus that we can all support. Not we have a closed door meeting and everybody went home happy. I never believed that every Malay leader went home happy after the closed door sessions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Chua, Professor Chua. Uh, Dr. Jilanko from IPS would like to ask a question. Professor Chua, hmm. when I think about what's gone on in the past, I'm not the same as you are. Can you just cite, without naming specific things, what? I don't see how a debate about uh, whether you can have a play on a woman, a Malay Muslim woman or an Indian Muslim woman saying she'd like to divorce her husband, that it would be a public play and that there would be another group that says go right ahead and do it publicly. And then 
if we have a controversy about it, that this can be done publicly and everybody will be, <laughs> will go away happy. I mean, somehow because they had a contest about that. Um, you know, I, I don't think that one group that feels disrespected will walk away and say, you know, nothing's been done about it. Um, I, I don't see how a debate about the weighting of mother tongue or specifically Mandarin and whether we can change it can be had publicly and then, <laughs> and then some consensus would emerge. I mean, I can only see contestation and if you say that we need practice publicly to find a way to establish the middle ground, I, I, I don't see how that is going to happen. Except if we start off and we say we value consensus and we must agree to disagree and that we establish principles for consensus finding that we would be able to have those public debates and even allow, uh, you know, have the disrespected groups walk away f happily. So I, I find it difficult uh, just to rest at your case and I find that the end point is really the other side of it. Could you please respond? Yes, uh, let me, because there are two examples and uh, I don't want to take up too much time, I, uh, let me use the second case of the question of Mandarin. Anyone in this room who has ever been to a public seminar conducted in Mandarin would undoubtedly come away and felt the unhappiness of the Chinese community that is committed to a Chinese, to a Chinese culture. It is a culture, it is now a language that is no longer viable in public. It is now in a situation where the so-called bilingualism produces young people who cannot speak, who cannot make a single sentence in one single language. Half in Mandarin, half in English, because they are competent in neither languages. It is a situation where there is always someone in the, in the audience who will confront the speakers on the, on the stage about how the government had led Chinese language, Chinese culture, atrophy to a point where it is now no longer viable. There are more students from Malaysia studying in Taiwan than Singaporeans. There are few Singaporeans now who really are able to go to a Chinese medium university. All this had been the result of an insistence that English should be the common language among Singaporeans. All this has been a policy based on a very mistaken idea that polyglot abilities is not good. So every, all the dialects must disappear in order to teach Mandarin and a Mandarin that is progressively watered down to the point where you can take second language as uh, Mandarin B. In, in Hokkien, they say Jia Liao B. <laughs> it's a total waste of time because it has been pressured by parents who find children having trouble learning English to the point where it used to be an important qualifying uh, qualification to go to university, it now doesn't count. So if you say, because we didn't have public debate, is this the result because we didn't have public debate about language policy? Is, did we produce happier people? If we had an open debate about language policy, would Chinese have deteriorated to the current standard? We don't know. So the thing is, in, this kind of, in the current situation, whether people would have been happy, would Singapore have been a happier a place if there were public debate? It's a counterfactual that can no longer be proven. See the, how the future unfold if we embark on a more open discussion society. Professor Kishore, do you want to respond in any way to that? 
Well, I actually, I'm glad that uh, Bing Huat has brought up this very difficult subject of language uh, policy, because that, that's an example of what could be very different in Singapore. I mean, it is actually, as you know, it was a very uh, brave decision by the government to say, hey, the common language should be English. Now, believe me, if we had gone the way of Sri Lanka, right, where the government decided that the common language should be Sinhalese and deprive the Tamils of even using their own language, you saw 30 years of civil war in Sri Lanka. That's what the choice of language is all about. And if you imagine a Singapore in which, as a result of, let's say, uh, mass voting, you ask people to vote, the majority to vote, what do you want your first language of Singapore to be? And if the majority democratically selects and says, hey, we want Mandarin to be the first language of Singapore, to be the official functioning language of Singapore, that's also possible. The democratically, through a process of discussion, we end up with that result. What kind of Singapore would that be? Would it be the Singapore we have today? Or would it be a very divided Singapore? This is my point about the fact that for 40 years, we've been living in a very special bubble where we didn't have to confront all these hard issues, where frankly, every other society has been confronting. And, the, and if you look again at what's the normal, whenever the issue of language surfaces politically, it almost never leads to a consensus. It almost always leads to divisions. And, and that's why, you know, I mean, Benguat is right. In theory, be much better off. Let's have an open discussion. Let's have a democratic selection. But trust me, you may not like the results. The results may be a Singapore, which is the exact opposite of what we have, what's ha what we have seen today. And all you have to do, by the way, very simple test. If you are a political scientist, and you want to sort of use the, 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 all the knowledge of social science to help you make a decision, look around the world at all the multi-ethnic societies and look at what decisions they made on language and how they made them, and then you can see the result. Yes, it is a fact that English language was imposed on <coughs> Singapore society. And the fact that it was imposed lead to a situation where you have Malays, Chinese, Indians in this room, and they do feel a sense of community because there is a common language that exists there. But if the opposite had happened, and if you had had a very popular politician like Thaksin Shinawatra emerge in Singapore and says, I can feel the pain of the majority community who feel that they've been cut off from their culture and their roots because they've not been allowed to use their language fully. And that kind of politician, if he or she emerges in the next 10 years, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Because that's the nature of politics. And especially if you look at a society like Yugoslavia, why did Yugoslavia suddenly go from being one of the most peaceful, multi-ethnic societies to splintering into four or five different nation states? Because they suddenly had democracy, and Slobodan Milosevic said, hey, we are the dominant community, we the Serbs. We must assert ourselves. We the Serbs should be in charge. And all the Serbs voted for him and the country fell apart. So I, 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 all I ask you to do 
is to look around at any other multi-ethnic society. I mean, don't forget about the dominant society, single language, it's very easy. Just look around the world. Use as your laboratory specimens live, existing, multi-ethnic societies. And tell me a happy story that comes from people choosing a language that represents the majority and ignores the minority. We are very fortunate that we did not make that decision, but if you allow people like Chua Beng Huat to bring out the language monster up again, I would say, be careful. Thank you, Professor Kisho. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give the floor one last question to ask to, to either of them. There's a gentleman over there in the corner. Yeah, um, hello. Yes, um, to Dr. Kishaw Mabubani. Can you um, please identify yourself? Oh yes, I'm so sorry. I'm Austin, I'm a student from RI. Um, to Dr. Kishaw Mabubani, um, to what extent do we value consensus in order to make a decision? In that, um, should we wait for all sectors of society to come to, an cons to a consensus? Should society and government agree fully? So for, in um, for instance, for the, um, in the casino issue, Society largely agreed that we shouldn't build the casinos, but the government overrode that consensus um, in favour of business interests. So, um, in this case, what should we do? And to um, Dr. Chua. Um, yeah, Sorry, I, I we can't hear you very hear. well here. Oh, do you okay. mind just repeating that last point again about the example you were giving? Oh, yes. Um, so sorry. The example I was giving is that um, on the casino issue, society largely agreed on that. On the what issue? Casino. The casino, casino building. Casino issue, yes. right. Okay. Um, society largely agreed that we should not build them. However, the government went ahead despite their consensus. So to what extent do we regard um, the consensus as important in the decision-making process? And to Dr. Chua, um, as I think Kishore, um, no, sorry, Dr. Kishore has mentioned, um, co um, contestation does not necessarily lead to consensus. So for example, on the 377A issue, um, society has remained divided and the government has effectively put off the problem saying that we need a greater consensus but the issue, um, there's no resolution in sight. So to what extent should we um, regard contestation as the means towards we should um, well be able to make a decision? Okay, Thank if I you. can just paraphrase that for Dr. Ch uh, Professor Chua. He asked how important is consensus in decision making in a government when you are saying that you are citing the casino issue as, as an example where the government went ahead while even though society didn't think it should have. Mm. That's your view of it. And for Professor Kishore, know, how important... Other way the other way around. The, first the other way around. All right, so that was for you. <laughs> and for Professor Chua, that how do you create a resolution when there's no resolution in sight for an issue like 377A? The government seems to have diffused the situation, but there's still no solution. Would that be right? Okay. Professor Kishore first, please. Well, I, I, I want to begin by saying that uh, achieving consensus is not an easy thing. I emphasize that it's a bottom-up process and not a top-down process. And actually, I actually think that uh, you know, there's an Indonesian two words called mushafara and mufakat, deliberation and consensus, where everybody is consulted, you talk to people, and you arrive at a decision, by the way, that may not necessarily, by definition, a consensus is something that doesn't please everybody. Because everybody has to give up something. Because if we all stick to our positions, there'll be no consensus. A consensus actually comes about everybody compromising, everybody giving way, and arriving at a, at a consensus. That's what it's about. And the, the casino example uh, is an interesting one. And you, you may be right uh, that if there was a referendum uh, in Singapore, and if the population comes out very, very strongly against the casino, it's possible that the license may not be renewed uh, when it's over. I, and I, by the way, I was personally very opposed to the uh, casino decision. I actually had a father uh, who was a, a compulsive gambler and got into deep trouble because of gambling. So that's an example where when you do have a consensual decision-making process, yes, it is possible, they may say, no more casinos. 
So it doesn't necessarily mean that the, as a result of the consensus, they will say whatever was done in the past was the right decision. Prof Chua. Uh, let me first take up, I mean, talk about Yugoslavia. <laughs> Yugoslavia <laughs> fell apart. Yes, it fell apart. Because Yugoslavia was always held together artificially by an imposition of a Communist Party. And the Communist Party in its, govern, in its, in its government it destroyed all civil society linkages among the population. So when the party collapses, the different groups in Yugoslavia had no other means of reorganizing themselves except to fall back into the most primordial basis of reorganizing. And at that point, there was never, there was no structures at all for possible negotiations. In which case, that, that it, the result was the kind of civil war that we saw. I'm saying that in normal societies, in normal, uh, in, in a society in which you know, this kind, if, if there was no false, if there was no coercive imposition, and if the society were de allowed to develop ties, uh, or, you know, civic ties beyond race, beyond religion, Yugoslavia wouldn't have fallen apart so quickly if it, it would fall apart at all. So we see, we do see very serious differences in, in democratic societies where it's, Differences have taken root, differences have become entrenched, but they don't fall apart. They muddle along. That's what they're supposed to do. The Tea Party held the government hostage for a while, but they didn't win America. They are now in somewhat of a retreat. None of their candidates now are electable as presidential candidate for the Republican Party in the, next, in the election to come. So we have to have faith that over a longer stretch of the time and not be in a hurry to always impose a decision. We have to have faith to have the debate sounded out. At some point, everyone, given their self-interest, will in fact give and take some and not be completely entrenched. On the case of 377A, it's not going away the kind of adjustment that had been made to say that we will keep it in the law book for, its symbol, for a symbolic stand on value, but we will not actively pursue its application is simply a shorthand, a short-term uh, solution. It is simply a shorthand solution that satisfies nobody. Because, and furthermore, to have a law in the book that will not be activated makes a mockery of the law. Why would you want a law that you're never going to use? And if it's there, if there is always a chance that it may be used when convenient or when necessary. So, we would better off to come to a decision and take it off. And because it will be challenged constantly over and over again, and it's going to cost the public a lot of money to continuously defend a law that we no longer want to use. Seems so absurd, doesn't it? Right? So is there no solution to is there no solution to 377A? Yes, there is. It's just we're not taking it. Okay, thank you, Professor Chua. We are going to now give each of the speakers three minutes for their closing arguments as we're running out of time. And the first person to go will be the opposer, which is Professor Chua. Your time starts now. Uh, no society, no, govern, no modes of government can run without ultimately agreement between the people, between those who are governed and those who are doing the governing. That's what we meant by consensus. Neither Kishaw and I disagree on that point. We believe that society has to run on consensus. Where we disagree 
is how this consensus is arrived at, whether this consensus should be arrived at by public debate with as much time as necessary, or whether should the debate be truncated in some way or another, either through our impatience, which we are famously known to want to have instant trees in every, in every aspect of life, either through our impatience or through our fear, precisely to our imagined fear that people will take extreme positions and so therefore we keep them behind closed doors. That kind of preemptive action is not verifiable because you, the, the logic is to say, you know, if we don't let it, you know, if it, it didn't have a chance to take place, how do you know it will not work? So we are always making very preemptory kind of decisions on the fear that things will go bad. You have to have more faith. In 50 years, we have not gone berserk. <laughs> and every time race riot is mentioned, I would like to remind you that we have not had a race riot since 1964. That's a long time. We have had not riots for so long, we actually don't know how to cope with the little India Mali. <laughs> we still insist on calling it a riot. Right? So, I mean, we have, you know, we've gone to a point where we now really can't cope with events. Uh, so, you know, I think my suggestion is that we have in the last 40 years lost our ability to be practiced in public discussion. In public discussion with the right attitude, in public discussion with the idea that eventually we will have to live with ourselves together and not as entrenched difference. Currently, the differences are not public, they are hidden. We don't even know what the differences are. And therefore, when Zainal say, do Singaporeans understand Malays really? No, we don't. Because we have never had proper access to how they feel, how they think. How is Islam, in some ways, different from all the rest of us who are striving like crazy and you know, living a life of uh, constant stress? Right? So that's my point. My point is not because we don't need consensus, but we need the process to, of arriving at consensus to be changed for the future. All right. Thank you, Professor Chua. Professor Kisho, your time starts now. Well, I beg what was right. <laughs> we agree that the people should decide. That's not what the discussion is about. It's about how you decide. He would like a process of public contestation. I say let us have consultation and discussion. And his position on 377A completely contradicts his earlier argument. His argument is let us have contestation on 377A, let the people vote. We already had contestation. Hey, hang on. You, you finish your time. <laughs> All right, all right, yes. Now you I have see, to step in and not pay not to play by the rules. <laughs> yes, That's why contestation is time does. for decision. <laughs> it, is, it is his uh, closing argument And if you, had, if you had a vote on 377A, you know what's going to happen? People will say, stick, uh, stick with the law and implement it. It will be a much more hardline, tougher position. And our gay community will suffer because of his contestation and voting. No. And he wants to walk away. Debated. He wants to walk away from that kind of difficult situations on the mythical assumption that if you had contestation and voting, we will naturally end up in harmony. And I can tell you, let me just give you two or three examples. Look at the current mood against foreigners in Singapore. You saw what happened to Anton Casey. One Facebook post, boom, he's out of Singapore. <laughs> you like that kind of thing? How many foreigners are you going to expel from contestation? Singapore? Where will Singapore be without these foreigners? So, that's, that's what contestation does. Hey, let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you're supposed to obey the rules. <laughs> that's what democracy is about. <laughs>
All right, you must all listen the to the opposition. Here, but yes. <laughs> so, and you look at what the mood is about rising inequality in Singapore. It's a concern all over the world. There's populism rising. It's rising all over the world. It's rising in America. It's rising in Europe. It will also come to Singapore. And if you had contestation, they will say, let us go and tax all these rich people, take away their bungalows, kick them out of Singapore, and where will Singapore be? So in this kind of environment, where you're getting a more difficult, more fractious environment emerging in Singapore, you unleash Chua Beng Huat, and you get him to push for more contestation, I tell you that you will not be happy with the results. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Your time is up. Thank you very much to both gentlemen. You can take your seats. Can I once again encourage all of you to pick up your voting devices? And we'll take a final poll to see who swayed whom the most. I'll pass my voting device to you so you can vote too. The proposition has won back the poll, swinging it back from 210 to 316. <laughs> the opposition is now at 232, and the electorate has increased once again without any boundaries to 548 from 541 earlier. Congratulations to both of them. A big round of applause, please, to the team for a very, very interesting debate. I'm sure you'll all agree with me. This has been the most Interesting. Interesting discussion that we've ever had at the conference, I think. Not entirely sure where we have both debaters agreeing with each other most of the time. <laughs> Except when last five minutes when they had to put on a bit of drama. So thank you all very much for your attention. I will now hand the floor back to Lynn.